this. You have to do all of this. What are the additional costs to the banks? And if you get it wrong, you can get criminal liability. So next slide. So, so the FinCEN memo hasn't really helped because the banks are saying, I'm at risk if I make a mistake in how I classify you. I have so much additional costs, how am I going to pass this on? And the call, call then supplemented his, his um, first memo by saying that the people who are prosecuting should also take into account FinCEN guidance and his guidance in terms of making prosecutions against banks. But the point is it is so easy to fall afoul of the rules that the banks who are willing to deal, you can go to the next slide, the banks that are willing to deal do so very hush. For example, it is said that Royal Bank of Canada does some he dealing, but they do so very hushed. And those that have announced it go back on quiet. And it is not just recreational marijuana. It now affects all kinds, whether it's medical, whether it's scientific, whatever kind of marijuana business, because it's all mixed up. And some medical marijuana is really disguised recreational marijuana. And so the banks are afraid. And this is why I say the US contagion. Because the US is the main financial market. And the, the Wolfsburg group, that, those are the main people like Golden, um, Golden Sachs. What's it called, Gold Sachs? Yeah, yeah right, Goldman Sachs, um, uh, Barclays Bank. All, all the big guys, and what have they said are their corresponding banks? Now, what is corresponding banking? Um, obviously, when you transfer money, the bank doesn't actually send some cash through the wire. You have banks that have debit and credit accounts for other banks, so that if Bank X is transferring to Bank Z, but they, they might go through Bank Y, because Bank Y might have an account for both banks X and Z. And bank Y would be the correspondent bank. So there are special rules for how cons correspondent banks do due diligence. And uh, this group has set up that not only must a correspondent bank look for how the country is classified. So example, if Jamaica was to get a bad classification, it would make problems for all our banks for all transactions, not just marijuana-related transactions. Every single transaction, whether you're hotel, you're doing gas, anything would come under increased scrutiny if your country's rating goes down. That's the first level. But with branches and subsidiaries, and almost all our banks in Jamaica are branches, subsidiaries, and affiliates. NCB is the only main one that is not. Um, they basically look at the parent branch. So for example, many of our banks are Canadians, I think two are, are Canadian, and you look, they look at the parent branch. But if there is additional suspect activity in the actual affiliate, they go through further checks. And they have to monitor suspicious activities and downstream activities. Now, next slide. Now, th th this tells you how it even gets further. Now, suppose, for example, Bank X wants to send money to Bank Z and Bank Y is the corresponding bank. But Bank X is a regional bank and facilitates Bank J in Jamaica. They have to now check on whether or not Bank J in Jamaica works. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that the correspondent bank is a contagion. It means that all over the world, any bank that has a, an account here in Jamaica that is going to be associated with a marijuana-related business is going to have to go through all of those due diligence criteria I pointed out. Because every single one is going to have to ensure to the correspondent bank that it is following the basic major rules, which are the US rules. So, so next slide. Now, OK, so are there, are there solutions? Are there ways around this? Now the, now, the interesting thing is that in the United States, um, and I say, first one, corporates and credit unions. People have said, well, why don't you have credit unions do it? And we know that here in Jamaica, the Bank of Jamaica has been uh, having rules and regulations to tighten up on due diligence rules by credit unions. But what's interesting is in Colorado, um, they decided they were going to do something about it. And um, they actually passed a law 
to allow credit unions to form that were just for marijuana-related businesses. And it hasn't worked it, because you still have to get Fed approval. And I think that what really underscores it is the fourth center credit union case. Now here, you had them not using that legislation, but actually going under the regular act to form a credit union which would serve marijuana-related businesses. And what happened? They did everything, they played by all the rules, but when they went to the Fed Reserve, they refused to give them approval. So they've taken the Fed Reserve to court. And you know what is so interesting? The Federal Reserve has gone to court to have the case struck out, saying what? Federal law is supreme. Federal law trumps state law. This, what they're doing is illegal under federal law, and the case must be struck out. Everyone is watching it because it would mean that banks would then even go further. Because what they're saying is in spite of the coal memo, in spite of FinCEN guidance, we are still going to play by the rules. We are still going to play by state law being supreme over, 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 I mean, federal law being supreme over state law. So everyone is watching that case because it means that it's not getting worse. The solutions are not real solutions. So the other thing that everyone's talking about is a card and electronic payment solutions. Like there's this guy, everyone knows, KindPay. Uh, KindPay is, 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 is uh, like an electronic platform. What they're saying is that you will use your phones and cards to deal with um, to deal with payment so that one business, you, you know, you can do everything through simply uh, from sea to sale tracking so that the, the guy who is, is paying for the, the, the seed can pay for it with a card and it's just a debit on, on, on a piece of board and everything's, but the point is that somewhere along the line, the money has to enter into the regular market. And, and how do you get into the regular market unless some entity, some bank, is willing to take the funds? And the problem for, for Jamaica is that we are already seeing the banks. Canada had said, this is pre-election, I don't know if it will change, uh, at least the banks servicing in Jamaica, that they'll have a zero tolerance. They're not willing to deal with any money, with any business, that is, is, is getting involved in marijuana in Jamaica, whether it's medical, scientific, anything else. You need to split up the accounts so that if, you're, if you are a university and you're getting involved in, in mar, mar, marijuana scientific research, you need to set up a separate entity to do that if you want to maintain um, foreign accounts. That, that, that is what the Canadian ones have said. We don't know if they'll change the tune. But, but we know that Royal Bank of Canada is taking very quietly, they're not publicizing it, but it's known, they, are, they do have a few marijuana accounts. Um, uh, but, but apart from that, uh, what, what do we do? Um, and, 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 and this goes to the whole notion of our approach to liberalization, and it's one that, that, that ministers and government, the government will have to consider, because um, depending on how we approach liberalization will affect the country brand in terms of its classification and also the promise, the great promise we have for research and all this work cannot go forward unless we have access to banks. Financing is, is, is not the problem because you can go on the stock market. You can go on the stock market, you can get the investors to put the money in. But we have seen what happens if you have to move around with crates of cash. And so, as I said, we heard the progress, we heard the promise. I just came to you with the problem. And I'm hoping maybe you can give me some solutions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like us to show some appreciation again for that very thoughtful presentation. And I'm sure some of you are going to have questions as we approach 
this particular session. I'd like, I saw a number of persons who are persons in the field of science and, and law. I'd like to introduce Dr. Cliff Riley, who is the head of the Scientific Research Council, one of my colleagues, right, in the area. And I'd also like to uh, introduce uh, Ms. Bellamy, from, who is the head of the Jamaica Intellectual Property Organization. These two persons head institutions which are part of what we refer to as the national quality infrastructure. This infrastructure which is necessary to be able to, en to enable uh, the building of a national cannabis industry. At this time, our next speaker is the man himself. He is Ras Ayavi, the man of the West, a local man, one of the founders of the Westmoreland Ganja Growers Association. He is a member of the Central Licensing Authority, which is the authority set up to deal with the regulation of the industry, representing the grassroots farmers. And I must say to Minister Golding and Minister uh, Hilton, participation in the building and the elaboration of this very complex industry. He, Mr. Uh, Ras Ayavi, is also one of the producers of the Rastafari Roots Fest. I wish you to give him a big round of applause as he presents. I started using herb at a very young age, so maybe at the age of seven. But growing up, we have always been about this plant marijuana, ganja. Happened us that I have studied, I have done a lot of research on marijuana, both from a scientific and from a legal point of view, legal in the sense that I am not a lawyer, but I am knowledgeable enough to know that the United Nations Charter has given constitutional rights to individuals freedom of religion, freedom of movement, freedom of expression, as long as in so doing, you are not infringing upon the rights of other people. So from that point of view, as a Rastaman, I decided I was not going to sit down and watch Rastafarians and grassroots people being continuously persecuted for a plan. I remember 1987, I had an argument with the former Prime Minister, Edward Siaga, and I ask him, who is man to make law against something that was created by the same power that created him man? Because if we are going to look at a plant and say it is illegal, then technically or indirectly we are saying man is illegal. And if we are going to say that we as a people, we are all illegal, then I think it's the end of the world. So I decided that in whatever way I could, I would confront the system. So from years upon years, I've been organizing marches, writing to the various governments, doing all that I think was possible for the government to acknowledge the rights of Rastafari, that if you don't want to legalize, decriminalize. I remember going to Bingy, it was a joy for the police to wait on us. Because they know as rats are we going to travel with her. So going to or coming from, we were always raided. And you know what that means, jailhouse. So this struggle went on. I remember um, 2013, we had a very good discussion with another Mark Golding. But I know one of the great concerns of Jamaican, Jamaican people is that we have signed on to the International Convention on Narcotics. And as such, 
as a country, we have international obligation. So I give thanks to Dr. Cathy and Brown again. I give thanks for um, Dr. Baxhill and the other members of the CLA board because, because I think what we are doing there is to just try to find the loopholes, try to find the avenues by which we can develop a cannabis industry here in Jamaica without violating any international law. And as such, again, I give thanks to Honorable Mark Walling because he had thought a way how to chart that course through the Ministry of Justice. I also thank the Honorable um, Anthony Hilton for making sure that the CLA board was established. I don't have any international obligation no. to, the, to the International Narcotic Board, but the government does. And as such, we as a people have an obligation to make sure, knowing that what the government is doing is in our interest, it is also our duty and responsibility to make sure that we protect the government. Not that I am saying that I am um, supporting all the laws and everything, but when it comes to the cannabis industry, I am prepared, I have reasoned, to give support to the government because at the end of the day, whether we want it or we don't want it, there are certain rules and regulations that we have to abide by. Simple because Jamaica has been so mismanaged that we no longer control our destiny. IMF run Jamaica. The World Bank run Jamaica. So in our ways as if we are just a puppet. I remember in January, the Assistant um, Secretary of State, Broomfield, mentioned that they were concerned about the direction that Jamaica was going, where the legalization and the decriminalization process is concerned. My response at the time was, who is America? to say what Jamaica should do and should not do, when all the years they have been sending helicopters coming down here, cutting down our herb, when they were researching in the labs in the US how to develop strains that had greater potency than that which was grown here in Jamaica, so that one day there would be a reverse market that we would have to buy herb from America. So my response was, who is America to say this when most of over half of the states at the time had been criminalized and legalized not only for medical purposes but also for recreational purposes. When you go to Colorado and you go into the hotel, there's a smoking tent. You don't smoke in the room, but there's a smoking tent. There are so many activities where marijuana is concerned in America that's helping to build the economy of America. We as grassroots people, we didn't have any legal avenue, so what we had to do? We had to smuggle. Because we know the use of the plant, and we know that people wanted the plant, whether to use it medicinal or recreational. So for the time being here in Jamaica, again, I give thanks for the amendment, because it allowed Zionaires Rastafari to, one, be in a position where we can move freer than we used to, and at the same time, to look at the potential of the industry in terms of its support for our grassroots people. I have myself, I have said on many, many occasions, I will in no way sit, stand, or lie down and watch this industry being taken over by rich people or foreign investors. <laughs> If we are to develop this industry, it must benefit Rastafari and it must benefit grassroots people because these are the people who are born the brunt of the persecution. It is we who, when everybody was going left, right, and center, I and I were the ones who have kept well. Some of our people, they never smoke herb. 
But the boy did fatigue. And when you look in the granny closet, or somewhere there was, there was some herb and white rum or Wincanis wine. My father never used to smoke. He was a Christian. But when he buy him herb, he make sure he leaves someone, some P.I. because he knows he smoke my herb and he can soak his own. And why did he do it? Like Dr. Lockhart and Dr. Manowith in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, they found out about herb and decided to do their research simply because they saw grassroots people using it. And I remember Dr. Manowith saying that when he went to Old Harbor to buy fish, he couldn't see the canoe coming in, but the other people could. And when he went out, certain things that these people could see, he couldn't see and they asked him why. The man took up a little bottle with some herb and some white rum and said, this is what we use, Doc. And that motivated and stimulated um, Dr. Lockhart and Dr. Manley West who were passed on to do his, their research. And they came up with Canasol for glaucoma, asthma sal for asthma, and I think there was one other product. Now, this shows us that we have the potential here to develop pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, and other products. But how marketable are these products in the international market? As Dr. Brown was saying, it's not that easy because there's an international narcotic convention and there's an international narcotic control board. Now, how do we go about, because that's a big problem, that's a big question, how do we develop an industry here in our way that we can market our products internationally? The Lord of America, as Dr. Catherine Brown was explaining, I don't know if anybody spoke what, uh, what was said before. But I know from my analysis of the situation internationally, I know that the US government at least this night analysis, is using state law as a guide to develop the cannabis industry and at the same time to fight against third world countries' development. <laughs> I don't think the state could have been doing what they want if the federal government was not in league with it without a, um, some form of legal confrontation. So as such, I think, again, Minister Justice and Minister Golding has a duty and a responsibility. The government of Jamaica has a duty and a responsibility to align themselves with other countries, because I know there are other countries. Here in the Caribbean, in the Latin America, and there, are, there are countries who are against this big stick that America has over our head, that you can do what I say, but not what I do. So I think we have a duty and responsibility to align ourselves with these countries because unity is strength. And as such, whether from a regional block or from the point of view that we are thinking similar as countries, to make sure that we become strengthened in such a way that we do have a say on the international political scene. Otherwise, we'll always have to succumb to this big stick that America has over our head. Now, in terms of what is going on out here, where the industry is concerned, it is said that we are focusing on medical marijuana. Medical marijuana is, de is defined as marijuana with high CBD and low THC. The ganja grown in Jamaica traditionally is one that has high THC and low CBD. But this is the same ganja that our people have been using medicinally over the years. And this is the same ganja that the security forces 
gave to Dr. Lockhart and Dr. Manley with to research and develop cancer cell and asthma cell. So as a fact, we do have medical marijuana and have been producing medical marijuana. Now, there's a company named Street Hill that came to Westmoreland, came to Jamaica and they came to Westmoreland. And we did some tests. And what we found out is that there are strains here that are, have low THC and high CBD. The other day I read, in the Gleena, Jamaica to import ganja. That was big on the frontier. I think some of you saw it, right? No, I think that was a very misleading article, our headline. Because when you read what you saw, what Jamaica to import ganja seed. My argument on the CLA board is why do we start with foreign? Why not try to identify what we have here and work from here, develop what we have? Now, the fact that there's some IP rights, I am not an IP expert, but I know there are IP rights as it regards to strains and seeds and so on. We cannot own what we import, but I think we can own what we have here. Now, based on what we have here, I have said also to Minister Hilton that I think there should be an interim period, or at least some period, that, for example, we here in St. Elizabeth, we have Sister Cathy, we have St. James, we have other parishes and people in different places that have seen. Why is it that we are not allowed to take our seeds legally, not to hide, but legally, to, for example, the BSJ, to UA, to UTEC, so that research can be done on what we have, so that we know what we have? I said, Dr. Della here, oh, over there, and I want to give thanks. I want to give thanks. Uh, Dr. Davis, and I want to give thanks for everybody who has made themselves available to be a part of the process of moving this industry in the best interest of our people. Because if it doesn't happen that way, I tell you, grassroots people are not going to sit down and take it. We will not tolerate the next sugarcane industry where our people is work for little and nothing. And then the big manufacturers come, make all this money, and we get little or nothing here, and the money is gone overseas. So we, don't, we can't develop our schools, we can't develop our roads, we can't develop what we have, simply because 80% or 90% of the profit gone to foreign. Now, Again, I've suggested, and I know Abel Silvera, I think he's here, I think I glimpse him, have been in support of the idea because we have been saying this, that anybody, any foreign entity coming here to do business in marijuana, it should be that they would have to partner with a local Jamaican company. I think that's the only way we can guarantee that we control our business here. Because all our other businesses have been taken over by foreigners. Now, I have nothing against foreigners. What I, what I hear is foreigners coming here and controlling what we have, and we get little or nothing out of it. And that is something that I'll always say, I'll always talk about it, that is my doctrine, that is why I preach, that we must control what we have here in Jamaica. <laughs> now, we have in the root space, at the fire I root space, 14 high times cannabis cup. And I don't at any time want the emphasis to be on high times cannabis cup. I want it to be on Rastafari, 
Rastafari Roots Fest, hosting High Times Cannabis Cup. Because I and I, as Rastafari, we know that some partnering will have to go on. And High Times, as a company that has been publishing for 40 odd years, publishing information on marijuana, and like I said, I have done a lot of research. I have a book named The Emperor Wears No Clothes, which shows that one of the most extensive research programs carried out on marijuana was done where? Right here in Jamaica by NIN, the National Institute of Mental Health from the U.S., um, Comita San Rubin, between 1968 and 1974, right here in Jamaica. And what it showed, it showed that marijuana was so beneficial to our people that, that the, 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 the research program was crap. Now, years ago, late um, 19th century, Oshagnesi, or Oshanesi, as a British doctor, went to India and saw documentation on marijuana more than 1,000 years old. When the Indian Health Commission was established in 1966, it proved that marijuana did not affect people mentally nor physically. I wouldn't really say that. Because I know if you eat it and you don't know how much you eat, it can hurt you. So the education is what is needed amongst our people in terms of how best to use it and how not to use it. And I thought Dr. Davis and Dr. Della here, I still give thanks to the Drug Abuse Association, but I still think there's a little somewhat of a hypocrisy there. Why do I say that? We have cigarettes that is killing people, thousands upon thousands per day, and it is legal. We have alcohol that is responsible for so much accidents on the road. And these things are legal. So if it doesn't matter that you are trying to protect, if the association is trying to protect us as a people, then we need to start with cigarette and alcohol. Yeah, but I still want to give thanks to all these associations, all these agencies, the SRC, the DSJ, because they all have a part to play in how we develop our industry. I look forward to working with all the entities, all the agencies, in the best interest of our people. So once again, as I give thanks for the here, I want to give thanks for Elena and Percy for putting on this, what I would say, I think a lot of information can come out of this, these seminars. We have ourselves are doing seminars here. We'd like Dr. Davidson, we'd like Dr. Della here, we'd like everybody here to pass through, at least pass through and see what is going on. Because it is really not about a ganja smoking party. It's about educating our people how they can benefit from this industry and how we can move forward as a country. Give thanks. Thank you. On behalf of, well, from the scientific community, I must say that you have, your presentation has displayed a level of leadership and maturity that this country has always looked forward to in times of crisis. And I thank you. We hopefully, hopefully, all of us will work together to get this right. And I think that at this particular time in our history, we have no alternative but to get it right. The final presentation before we go into the question and answer session will be made by one of my colleagues who has been working, doing research, 
and cannabis over the last six years. He's professor of molecular biology. He's also dean of the Faculty of Med Medical Sciences at the University of the West Indies. And he is director of Caribbean Genetics and Caribbean Toxicology at the UWI. He's director of Forensic Science Program at the Uni University of the West Indies. And his work has, in fact, resulted in the award of the Sil Silver Musgrave Medal for Science in the year 2000. And one. He is also doing research in plant molecular biology and genetics. He heads the particular unit, Carigen, which is part of the national quality infrastructure. It is in that context that you're going to be able to see how the rights of Rastafari will be protected using the scientific institutions and scientific work that is present, presently active. I'm not talking about passive, actively taking place. And so it was all, without further uh, hesitation, I wish to invite my friend and colleague, Professor Wayne McLaughlin of the University of the West Indies, and he will speak to the topic, new opportunities for global collaboration in medical cannabis research and clinical studies. Professor McClockett, the ground work. I want to thank Amanda for the invitation. Actually, it's my principal who should have been here, Professor Archibald McDonald, but he had to travel, so he sends his um, apologies. So he asked me to come instead. So um, my talk basically will be looking at some opportunities. Um, in terms of how we can you go ahead, move ahead in terms of research, some of the research possibilities. And actually, I will even say some of the work that we have been doing over the last five, six years. Are you doing that also? Yes. And then also um, look at some of the clinical areas that we really can focus on, low-hanging fruits, as we call them, you know, that here in Jamaica we can get going. So um, just very, so to move ahead, um, I know most people would have known know about cannabis here in, 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 in this room, so I don't have to go into too much detail. But essentially, it is thought to have, um, it's the oldest plant in cultivation, one of, I should say. And it's believed to have been originated in Central Asia, somewhere in Himalayas, and extending into China. And it has been recorded in use in China over 6,000 years. So it has really been used quite a bit, and it's used for many, many purposes, for fiber, you know, food, oils, medicine, and of course, religious um, purposes. Next slide. Um, in terms of some of the taxonomy and the biology, um, it belongs to the family can Cannabinaceae, and it's one of two in, in, in the family. Humulus, hops is the other in, in that group. And taxonomy, um, there's still, still some discussion about that, you know, how many species and what the species are but it is regarded as a monospecific genus, meaning that there's only one genera. So cannabis sativa, next slide. All right, so cannabis sativa. So there are sativa subspecies, like indica subspecies, sativa subspecies, rudealis. And some of the differences basically in terms of classification is based on the THC level, the, 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 the height of the plant, you know, the size of the sheet, the, the, how many palmates in, in, in the leaves, you know, wide it is. So there are some subtle differences, but overall it's more on the amount of CDB, how much T, THC that, that's present. Right. Other classification is based on chemotypes, that is the chemical properties. So apart from the phenotypic expression of the plant itself, there's also three types that they have been cla um, classified in or grouped in. Chemotype 1, which is considered the drug type, where you have higher THC compared to CDB, and usually very high in THC content. The type 2 is where you sort of have a balance with, between THC and CDB, one-to-one -one in, in some, some instances. And um, 
sometimes you have a slight prevalence of CDD over THC. So that is the type two. So when, when we talk about medicinal cannabis, we're looking at, looking at those that will have a good balance between THC and CDB, and in most cases, those that have higher CDB compared to THC. And as first man was saying, you know, in terms of what we have in Jamaica, which is really true, most of the cannabis that we grow in Jamaica are high THC. But when we talk about high in Jamaica, we're not talking about the 20%, 30% that we hear people talk about in the US. Generally, between 5%, 7% THC. So there's a good balance, we think, between THC and CDB in our strains, historically. So which is probably why it has been used medicinal as, you know, culturally for most medicines rather than a straight high, you know, in, in that sense, which is really good. And also, we have been doing quite a bit of screening also in terms of what we have been doing at UA in terms of looking at the different chemotypes. So we, have, we are looking at the genetics, so we are looking at different genetic markers, and not necessarily those markers that are responsible for the production of THC or CDB. We are looking for other genetic markers that essentially we can use. So this plant is much more, well, as a molecular, plant molecular biologist, it's much more than just THC and CDB. There are many other useful genes that we have found so far that we, have, we just didn't expect to be in cannabis. So these are some of the areas that we really are pushing in, in terms of the genetics. It's not just THC, CDB. Of course, we'd like to be able to manipulate CDB ratios to THC, but that probably will come later. And of course, chemotype three, this is a non-drug type, where essentially it has mainly CDB, and the ratios of THC are generally less than 0.3%, 0.1%. Right. Next slide, please. All right, I know you won't be able to see the chemical structure, but that's not important here in this room. <laughs> but essentially, in terms of the cannabinoids, that is the phytocannabinoids, there are more than 100 phytocannabinoids found in cannabis, sativa, and they tend to fall into those 10 groups, and they are all closely related. So if you look at the general structure, you know, those little side groups are different and things like that, and that makes a difference in terms of the property of that particular cannabinoid, which is which is good. Um, the pr prevalent ones are THC, of course, and CDB, but there are many other cannabinoids that needs to be studied, many, many, many. And again, when you talk about pharmaceuticals, you know, you talk about isolating one particular cannabinoid and using that, but we think that with this plant, it has, to, all of them has to be present but maybe at different ratios to give you different medicinal properties. So this is what we are looking at. What are the ratios of the um, CBN, CBG, you know, all the other smaller ones that are really not published, you know, in terms of, 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 um, of cannabino phytocannabinoids. Next slide. So there's a lot of research to be done, a lot of research. Next slide, please. Right. The other one, other chemical that has been found in, of course, we all know, are the terpenoids. That is what gives it that smell, that perfume smell, or that woody smell, or that nice aroma. This is where that smell comes from. So terpenoids basically are essential oils. So these are oils that can be extracted separately from the, the cannabinoids. And if, just, just think of bottling that and making a perfume. <laughs> but. These are some of the things we are looking at. So we know it has a very, very sweet smell. Some, some of the strains we have worked with, absolutely a sweet underlying smell that someday I'm sure somebody's going to look at that as a perfume. But there are more than 200 reported um, terpenoids. Most of them are monoterpenes, like limonene, which we all know is in citrus, right? So citrus oil, myrcene, myrcene's fragrance, Right, um, that's um, nutmeg type family. And pinene, right, these are all the fragrances that we associate with perfumes and, 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 and so. So there's a separate market then basically that you, we, we could look at. And these are all generally regarded as safe. So this is a, these are approved by FDA, USDA in terms of the terpenoids. Right, so these are not drug related, so these are separate chemicals. So, and again, I should say this is 
and here it is completely understudied in terms of the relationship between cannabinoids and terpenoids. What is the, the role? What are the relationships? We know it protects the plant, for example, in terms of insects and animals. If you notice the cow, don't go and eat down the plant, right? Because they, there are some terpenoids, of course, that are toxic to the animals, right? So they, they don't mess around with it. Next slide. All right, so the challenge is, of course, opposition to medical, medicinal cannabis is based on the lack of understanding of the science. So there's still a lot of science to be known about cannabis. And again, being illegal, there's been a shortage of scientific and clinical evidence that usually accom accom accompany the introduction of any new treatments or processes or, or things like that. So being illegal basically, basically stifled a lot of the research that could really have been done. Next slide. So again, as we mentioned, heard earlier, it is placed alongside heroin, which is a Schedule I drug. Defined, it's defined as being too dangerous to actually do research with, <laughs> you know, so it's just ridiculous. Anyway, um, consequently, very little research is done and the medical benefits to get funding actually also for medical research also has been stifled just because of that reason. And if you could get more information, more science, of course, this could result in the reclassification. So moving from a Schedule One down to a less of a, of, of a dangerous drug. Right. So the more we know about it, of course, this is going to be really important. Next slide. So what are we doing basically? At so we're looking at some of um, research in all areas. So starting from the very basic research, looking at the applied, and of course, clinical research. So you is really well poised to actually cover all those areas. So being in the medical faculty, you know, it gives us the ability to move from the basic research right through to the clinical research. And in terms of the departments, um, although I'm a plant molecular biologist, I'm in the faculty of medicine. So you may wonder why, but we always say healthy plant, healthy planet, so, right? <laughs> so in terms of the basic research, I said we have been doing quite a bit on the genetics. So as first man was mentioning, we need to know more about the strains we have in Jamaica. So we can have some profiles done so this say uh, this is Jamaica. And that is what we have been doing over the last five years, essentially slowly collecting some material and start and have done a lot of the genetic profiling. And that has led us actually now to look at other genes that are probably specific markers that could say this is a Jamaican strain versus something out of the US or somewhere else. So that is some of the basic work we have been doing. Other basic work is to actually profile so all the THC levels, the CDB levels, all the other cannabinoids. So there's a PhD student who's actually doing quite a bit of that work. And we actually, as Prof. Winty Davidson said, in terms of carrygen, Caribbean genetics, that's one of our main job is genetics. So it doesn't matter if it's human, animals, plants, viruses, from H1N1 to chick B, you know, that's basically what we do. But using the genetics is gonna be really, really important. So strain improvement is something that we could look at. As we say, most of our strains in Jamaica are not high CDB, but there are some with high enough CDB, about 5% that we have seen, and that's a very good ratio in terms of CDB to THC. So we could start from somewhere, and that's a good start. But there are some limitations, Minister, that we really need to look at, even still in the actual um, decriminalization that we have had, but there are certain things that are still holding back even faster progress. So we could discuss that. The applied research and clinical studies. So next slide, please. Next slide. All right, so aspects of, as, as we just said, the ap applied area, the basic area, so the genetics is gonna be important, the biochemistry of the plant, the molecular biology, and of course this will lead us to a greater understanding about the plant itself in terms of the growth, development, disease, because once you start mass cultivate, any crop basically, you're gonna have to contend with pests and diseases. So we really need to know about those factors. Metabolism, of course, and of course, the chemistry of the plant constituents. 
And these are some of the things that we have been, we have been doing. Next slide, please. Again, med medical area, there are so many different discussions about what it can do. But these are, and most of them are anecdotal. There is no real hard evidence you know, to back up. You know, the science is needed. So, next slide. Right, so there's, we, all right, right. So, as I said, there are, there, there are many, again, challenges, because there's no real hard evidence, and some of the challenges is the lack of standardization, right, um, in terms of the product that, are, that is made so far. Um, so, in terms of prescribing to patients, we want to know that every time that patient go to get a prescription of, whatever it is, cannabis product, it has to be the same every time. You know, you can't go this day, you get something else, and tomorrow you get a different you know, com combination. So it is really, really important that we stabilize the phenotypes of the plant. We know what plant or what strain gives that product. So that is going to be really important. So we get the same product from one crop to the next crop. So we're looking at that. Next, next um, slide, clinical trials, again, few countries, so this is a good opportunity for Jamaica. Very few countries allow clinical trials, right? and the university is set up, we have a clinical trials unit that has been in existence for, since Prof. Davis was a, was a, was a medical student. <laughs> so basically, you can now conduct very controlled experiments, and, and, and to look at reliable systems, delivery systems. So all of that is in place. At, at UWI. Next slide, please. Again, collaboration, right, in terms of um, getting everybody on board at the same time. It's going to be important, so we need to get our, all our researchers, everybody, and then we can look at certain um, diseases and target certain diseases. So things like um, epilepsy, children with severe epilepsy, that's one clear area that we can move in right away. Um, adults with painful terminal illness, so for pain management, and also for cancer. Right, those, are, those are three main areas as a low-hanging fruits in terms of clinical trials that can be done right away. Next, next slide. Next slide, thank you. Um, it's known that it works very well as an anti-inflammatory agent. For cancers, for example, prostate. And, you know, in Jamaica, we have a high incidence of prostate cancer among men. So this is one good fertile ground to, to start that work. And of course, type 2 diabetes. Again, Jamaica is known to be, have a high type 2 diabetic rate. Next, next slide. So overall, so it's important for the government, researchers, growers, counselors, patients, to all get engaged in this business and to understand the positive side of cannabis. Mr. Paul, when he was handing over the license to UTEC, says that stressed the need for research to enable Jamaica to maximize the full economic benefit of a legal and regulated marijuana industry. So I think this is really, 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 really needed. Next slide, please. So the opportunity, this is an opportunity for Jamaica to write in cannabis into the medical, into the modern medical history. And I think somebody alluded to that earlier. So we have a chance now to really get this right. And maybe we only have one chance to get it right. So next slide. All right, so again, maybe you don't see this very well, but that's the last slide here. So we have been looking at as strains, and we have been looking at different issues or problems. Because we know germination is one issue or prob problem of cannabis seeds. And we have gotten up to 70% germination, which is far more than what we have read about. And we are looking at different routine medium, combination of fertilizer mixes, and we have gone through the whole cycle in terms of strain types, um, morphology of the plant. Um, so right now we can get, well, harvesting within two, in two months. And we have a ratio of about, um, I think I made a note of it here, 40% of the flour dry weight to the total plant. And we can go a lot more than that. Right? So this is just a start. These are not any changes that we have done. These are just 
looking at how we can improve on the nutrition of the plant, for example. So those are, those are very simple things. So within two months, we can get a crop, and 40% of the plant is, is the flower. Right? And I say we have gotten 70% germination so far. So thank you very much. <laughs> Or is the gap job that is going to be featured at the Roots Fest is the transport from point A to point B. Um, I know that through a lot of ex um, I have contact with exhibitors that when we contact with the Ministry of Tourism to ask the, the regulators or the people who are at the ministry only were aware that the ministry was going to do an event, but they didn't really know what was the process. Yes, Scott? Yes.
and most of the universities get a percentage of their funding from the federal government, which means by default, they can't do something that's federally illegal. Therefore, the universities that are doing the studies can't study it because they would lose their funding from the federal government. So it's a catch-22. And you also have to look at the big pharmaceutical companies in the United States that also are afraid of anti-banking laws. And actually, what Dr. Brown was referring to is what they call RICO laws, which are racketeering laws that come from illegal operations. So those operations are all considered federally illegal, which means that research is not being done. It's not being done by the pharmaceutical companies. It's not being done by the universities. So those things aren't happening, which actually, to me, puts Jamaica in a very unique position, much like Canada. Canada, Israel, and Jamaica really are the countries that have the opportunity to do advanced research that nobody else has done. And that puts this country in a leadership position there. I think that's very important. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. I just wanted to say that over the last 10 years, the Baker Foundation has collaborated in research with King's College, but you have to find universities willing to do it. And then the Baker Foundation has to find the funding to get the research to it. So there's small neuroscientific research, but now I'm just planning one at NYU using CBD to look into addiction of alcohol, nicotine, cocaine, and new psychoactive cannabinoids. And so the bigger universities are beginning to be interested because they get good papers out of it, but they charge so much. I mean, I get in very cheaply because I get the whole thing kind of behind the doors. But if you go through the official doors, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, Minister Hilton has articulated a vision of Jamaica becoming a logistics-centered economy where, you know, it's a place where things, it's easy to do business, it's easy to move things in and out of Jamaica, and, you know, we are much more competitive globally. Um, and certainly, he will explain, I'm sure, how the cannabis industry fits into that framework. But I want to mention that he was the matching partner in Jamaica's first specialist aviation, maritime and international trade, energy, and general commercial law practice, and is well respected locally and internationally as a visionary thinker and skilled negotiator who understands the modern global trading system and the importance of integration by small economies into the global economy. Minister Hilton was a leading figure in negotiations in the World Trade Organization the European Union, African, Caribbean, and Pacific Cotonou Agreement, the Free Trade Areas of the Americas Agreement, and the CARICOM Single Market and Economy Discussions. Um, he is a member of parliament and the deputy chairman of the People's National Party, and also chairman of the National Competitiveness Council. And I can say, you know, working with Minister Hilton, that he is very passionate about this industry and seeing that this industry is developed, uh, the cannabis industry is developed into one of the best industries in Jamaica. You know, you want it to be developed on a proper footing and also a well-regulated footing, but one in which Jamaica benefits uh, from the potential of this plant. And so at this point, I ask you to welcome Minister Anthony Hill. The conference, I think, presents a timely opportunity for us to discuss the ongoing work towards the creation of a legal cannabis industry in Jamaica, meeting as we are in the periphery of Roots Fest, which celebrates the sacramental rites of Rastafari. Ladies and gentlemen, it is important that our efforts to develop the, develop the cannabis industry not be seen in silo. We're now witnessing the transformation of the once obscure and mainly underground marijuana industry, which has been steadily gaining increased traction globally. Indeed, more and more countries are seeking to develop and regulate marijuana as a profitable commercial industry. Our efforts, therefore, 
critical to ensuring that we have a foothold in the development of these industries, even while other countries are getting their own, their own houses in order. Each country will undoubtedly carve out their own competitive marketing angle, but none has a greater opportunity than we here in Jamaica do to leverage the country brand association with marijuana. This association, once seen as a negative, now holds tremendous potential for the country's growth efforts. And the global competition is already heating up. Only last week, US Democratic presidential hopeful, Senator Bernie Sanders, introduced legislation that would end the federal prohibition on marijuana, removing the drug from the federal government's list of, quote, the most dangerous, end quote, substances. Under Sanders' plan, 